on March 10th, 2010. I saw I had, a, I had an email um, f from the office of the Dalai Lama. It began, responding to your invitation of 2007, His Holiness would like to visit the University of Arkansas on May 11th, 2011. And I almost dropped the phone. I sat down on the steps in the dark and read the letter. And I just, I sat there. I sat there for I don't know how long, in the dark, just thinking. Five years later, now he's coming. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> this endorsement is a serious, huge book. These are very important, and uh, there are many reasons. Here, the endorsement is considered to be a blessing. This inspired tech students, this continuity project. As we're doing interview Tibetan orderlies, these Tibetan orderlies are responsible to preserve a Thai Tibetan culture. They've been through a difficult time. When we go to India, students sit by these Tibetan orderlies, and you can imagine these people have been through. And uh, you name it, many of those are being Chinese jails. Uh, they bit uh, years and years, still they don't have uh, this, you know, an uh, animosity, anger, hatred toward anybody. I think it was Hillary Clinton in 1996 uh, who popularized really the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, and ever since then, that phrase has turned up um, all across. Uh, the cultural spectrum uh, in this country and other countries as well and and I have thought about that phrase every time I think about the text program because as Geshe and I uh, have have raised the text program it has reminded me of how many people participated in bringing the text program to fruition um, from from the beginning our students have been there our administrators, from from the staff in the honors program, um, to the dean, to the chancellor of the university, um, to the people in the study abroad office, everyone has helped the text program grow and develop, and we are uh, extraordinarily thankful for their encouragement. I know of no other program anywhere in the country, anywhere in the nation, like this one, and I'm very proud of it. The Tibetans in Exile Today program gives our students, our great students, a unique educational opportunity. We owe an additional debt to those of you involved in the text program because I believe that that program brought all of us in contact with the Dalai Lama. His distinguished lecture this past year, uh, a direct result of your invitation and most likely a show of appreciation for you by the Dalai Lama and respect for your work, brought really great honor to this university. I am extremely proud of the work that you're doing. I want you to know that. I know you are proud of it too, and you justifiably should be. Thank you. The text program has been covered by the local uh, and state and, and regional media as well. Um, but I have to admit that I was surprised uh, when the sports channel ESPN got in touch with me and said that they would like to do a spot on the text program. A unique partnership between an English professor and a Tibetan monk has students at the University of Arkansas learning a variety of life lessons outside the classroom walls. Through the text program, or Tibetans in Exile Today, students are traveling to India to record the histories of a storied and endangered culture.
we need to grow up as individual ourselves. Doesn't matter who we are, because each single us wants to one thing: happiness. Happiness is provided by altruism, love, and compassion. Your own possession is not going to provide you happiness. The text program, an oral history project, offered every other summer. Is a six week, six credit course in which students travel to India to record video interviews with Tibetans. They're creating a permanent online archive. In September of uh, 2011, the camera crew from ESPN showed up. They followed Geshela and me around campus. They talked to our students, they did the interviews, and they made a five minute video that showed in January of 2012 on ESPNU. That, of course, brought even more attention to the text program, which Geshe and I were delighted about because bringing attention to the text program in turn brings, brings attention to the Tibetans who are currently living in exile in India, and that's what the text program is about. gives the students is some sort of sense of an obligation. So once you go over there and you meet these refugees and you sit down in their houses and you see them on like the way that they live and everything like that, once you come back, I feel like it's hard to go on with a normal life after that. So then like a lot of my fellow students have gone to law school or going into professions that have some sort of public service element. Um, so I guess overall the text project really um, kind of makes you strive to do something better uh, in the world than maybe what you were going to before that. Uh, we're going to cover today six perfections. Um, that wonderful subject. As soon as Geshe Dorje arrived on, on the Arkansas campus um, in August of 2006, he and I started plotting about how we might do a study abroad trip to India because he had grown up basically in India uh, and grown up in the monastery in the south of India. So in 2007, in May of 2007, Geshe and I left here to go and do the trip in India that I had hoped to take University of Arkansas students on at some time in the future. Because we were going to be living in the Tibetan refugee settlements, I wanted to do the trip beforehand by myself to see if it were in fact a possible trip uh, for University of Arkansas undergraduates. Completed the trip. Um, and thought that it was eminently possible uh, for our students to do it. But I wanted the trip to be something more than a kind of, um, you know, point and shoot study abroad trip, the sort of let's take pictures of the Taj Mahal and go back. While those kinds of trips are very valuable, I wanted to do something else. And when I got back at, toward the end of May, I was talking uh, to my wife about it. I was, I was talking to Geshe about it. And, and I believe it was my wife who, who mentioned something about the fact that, that uh, I might think about an oral history project. Nimanyetinu I had had a conversation in New Delhi with an elderly Tibetan man, uh, and with a translator, I heard, I heard his story. He told me about growing up in Tibet. He told me about uh, the Chinese occupation. He told me about 
uh, escaping Tibet, walking over the Himalayan mountains, and how he is currently passing his life uh, in the Tibetan settlement of Majna Katila. And while he was telling me the story, I remember clearly thinking, I wish I had a tape recorder, I wish I had a video recorder because we need to capture these stories. And so that memory uh, and our talk about, about doing an oral history uh, gave rise ultimately to the text program. The unique feature of the text program is that it puts the University of Arkansas students on the front lines uh, of doing the oral history. They learn about how you do an oral history. You want me to like? They plan the interviews, they conduct the interviews, they do the transcriptions when we come back from India, and they help in building the website and ultimately uploading the interviews to the online archive so that they will be preserved uh, and will be available to the general public. Ani ngalo chuni kala jamit ani maja tenzu che kalas ngaso pugu chun chun tuzo ki ngaso jamit la pal shogu maris ngaso japa amerika yores yores tari ni amerika tuzo thong pe gapu chungs te ngaso lumpa te rik ke ke pal shina singo la thang yin song ta rik ke pal shina nang lu de yores lo chuni ani ni ma kala pam Papa does a gender magic and Royang on the young chap chain, then a young girls, and then my tie on the Jamie Yonzo Pig, Alonso Mumpa, Nanli Deshas, and that's okay. She not there. She knowledge in the Kamba Pogumaris, that took the Dutch Major. The text project was certainly an eye opener about a way of life that we can obtain. And, it, and it's something that's really deep and profound, and it's something that you really have to work on. It has to be something that you're mindful of. Um, so it really takes some work. So ever since the text project, I've been trying to, to remember to forgive everyone and you know, just throw love at a situation whenever you feel hurt. One of the singular features, I think, of this text program I didn't plan on and has developed gradually. Uh, and that has to do with, with what happens when our students sit down across the table from one of the elderly Tibetans to actually conduct the interview. It dawns on us that, that the Tibetans are giving their answers to our questions from a genuine, authentic perspective of nonviolence. Their answers, their comments, their ideas, their hopes for the future, their fears, all of these things come out of a center of nonviolence. That is, a center of looking at people not by what divides them but by the kinds of things that the human community holds in common and shares so that what our students see basically is a gallery of faces of nonviolence. of nonviolence in the world today, to be up close and personal with that was, was life nourishing, life altering. I'm in my first year of law school and I want to spend my first summer working with Tibetans in India. I feel like if I can absorb a little more and learn a little more from Tibetan culture, maybe I can be a more effective change agent as a lawyer. Spend time around these Tibetans, across the table from them, and our students suddenly see the face of nonviolence and they understand okay this is how a nonviolent practitioner responds to political division this is how they respond to 
you know, sectarian strife. This is how they respond to hunger. It gives them examples of how they can do it in their own lives. And so the interviews give them a very practical basis for nonviolence and understanding it and saying, okay, this is how it operates. And, and, and that was not an intended consequence um, of the text program, but I think it's has turned out to be one of its strongest attributes. For me, the Tibetan freedom struggle is not because I'm Tibetan, therefore I have the responsibility. I feel that the Tibetan freedom struggle, firstly, is one very rare hope to bring back a strong reassurance that nonviolence did not die with Martin Luther King. It is still here. It is possible and this is a one rare opportunity for the world to regain our hope in nonviolence and therefore work with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It's a chance for all of us to say that nonviolence did not die and governments and the people and individuals and organizations need not resort to violence. Nonviolence is possible, it's difficult, but it's possible. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama is trying and therefore we have to be with him. And I, as a Tibetan, as a Buddhist, and also as a Tibetan, I feel that uh, because we inherit the culture, we have more responsibility to take the lead, to take uh, direct uh, leadership and responsibility in this.